Well, a very warm welcome everyone to today's Storyhouse uh, lecture. I am going to be recording today's um, uh, talk just because some people might not be able to make it and they've asked me to, to make it available. So this is a regular series, it's a collaboration between Storyhouse and the University of Chester to provide an open forum for debate and discussion. My name is Dawn Llewellyn, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Religious Studies, Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Chester, and I focus on gender and contemporary Christianity. So that basically means I'm a raving feminist who likes to talk to self-identifying women about the ups and downs of their spiritual and faith lives. I have focused on women's religious reading practices, motherhood and childlessness in Christian context, and the tricky relationship between feminism and religion, the subject for today. So thank you very much to Sai Poole and to Keris Williams for the invitation to take part in this series and for their organisation. It's always such an honour to take part in a Story House event. Thank you for all the work that Story House has been doing to keep things going underneath uh, through these COVID-19 times. We're very lucky to have this house in our city. Thank you all for taking the time to tune in. I sincerely hope you and your families, your loved ones and households are safe. As you know, Zoom enables free meetings for a maximum of 40 minutes for multiple users. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, then I'll end this Zoom meeting very briefly and we'll restart it again. You can use the same link, the same password to rejoin the meeting, meeting and we'll have some time for question and answers. If you haven't muted your microphones, please do so. Uh, I have tried to mute you all, um, but it sounds like there's still a little bit of interference coming in. So please feel free to tweet at Storyhouse Live, at Dawn Llewellyn. But in the meantime, sit back, put your feet up, and I hope you find this interesting. Feminism and religion. Well, it's certainly complicated. Feminism might have emerged out of the Christian abolition and temperance movements of the 19th century and the suffrage critique of patriarchal Christianity. And while many women embrace their feminist and faith identity, it can be difficult to understand why women belong to religious institutions that disempower and oppress. So today I'm going to explore the ways this trickiness appears by using different examples from stages of the women's movement, what is sometimes known as the waves of feminism. There are thought to be four, so I'll take each one in turn. And although it's not a perfect metaphor by any means, it is a useful device to explore some of the tricky ways religion, spirituality, gender interact. We can see the contestation, but a deeply enmeshed relationship between feminism and religion right at the start of feminism's development. in the historical emergence of the women's movement in the UK and the US during the first wave campaigns that began in the mid 1800s. These pioneering women, and I'm thinking of people like Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, they were campaigning for the women's vote. They were experiencing physical and psychological injury and abuse, sometimes violently. They were agitating to change the unequal social, political, and economic conditions. Sojourner Truth, the former enslaved American activist, was inspired by her Christian faith to demand human rights, not just for black communities, but for women, an incredibly risky thing to do at the time in which she was operating. Others directed their challenge at Christianity's sacred text and their interpretations. For example, in July 1848, a group of women who I've named here, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Mary McClintock, Mary Coffin Wright, were brought together by Jane Hunt. The women were active in the abolition and temperance movements. Stanton and Mott had met at the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention with their husbands. Mott was actually on honeymoon, but they were excluded as delegates from participating because they were women. But on this day in July, they met over tea to discuss their frustration and anger at gender injustice. And in that meeting, they decided to organize a women's rights convention. 
And just 10 days later, we can talk about the efficiency of girl power and women's organizational skills after this. But in 1920, uh, on the 19th and 20th July, 300 delegates met in Seneca Falls, New York, to discuss, they said, the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. During that conference, a hundred delegates signed what is now known as the Declaration of Sentiments, a document that was mainly drafted by Stanton, modeled on the American Declaration of Independence. It listed the, they said, the repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. They were talking about marriage, divorce, education, law, finance, property ownership. And they conclude the man has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Religion was one of the injuries that was named in the, <laughs> in the declaration, particularly because of male authority. When it says he here, it's referring to all the blokes. So he allows her in church as well as state, but a subordinate position, claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry and with some exceptions from any public participation in the affairs of church. The document also says, he has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign for her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and to her God. So for Stanton and her colleagues, women's liberation was dependent upon rejecting and reforming religious, specifically Christian teachings and discourses. Their project included a radical examination of the biblical text. In 1895 and in 1898, Stanton, along with a revising committee of 26 other women, including Susan B. Anthony, published the two volume, The Woman's Bible. Commentary to highlight the relative invisibility of women in the scriptures and to correct androcentric interpretations of the text. It pulls very few punches in its impassioned assessment. The editors claim the Bible in its teachings degrades women from Genesis to Revelation. Those who don't know the text, that's all of it. And in one of my favorite passages from the preface, the anchor, the anger is palpable. They say, the Bible teaches that woman brought sin and death into the world, that she precipitated the fall of the race, that she was arraigned before the judgment seat of heaven, tried, condemned, and sentenced. And marriage for her was to be a condition of bondage, maternity, a period of suffering and anguish. And in silence and subjugation, she was to play the role of a dependent on man's bounty for all her material wants. And for all the information she might desire on the vital questions of the hour, she was commanded to ask her husband at home. Here is the Bible position of woman briefly summed up. So the women involved in Seneca Falls and the woman's Bible had different relationships to Christianity. Stanton quite famously came to reject it. Susan B. Anthony was at best agnostic. Matilda Gage maintained a personal faith but opposed the church's views on women. Mott remained a Quaker. But they were acutely aware and critical of the biblical texts, church teachings and doctrines that had influenced societal and cultural structures that limited and to use their words, degraded women's place and status. These first wave feminists noted that the liberation of women meant liberation from institutional religion as it had been interpreted and narrated by men. And they saw how Christianity had been harnessed by men to support women's disenfranchisement in all realms of public and private life. So challenging political patriarchal norms meant challenging long-standing religious beliefs, values and practices. The women's movement emerges out of the work of Christian women and their challenge to Christianity. The relationship between feminism and religion also takes on a tricky flavour if we fast forward to the so-called second wave a politically self-defined movement of activism associated with the 60s, 70s and 80s that highlighted the multiple ways women, to use Simone de Beauvoir's phrase, 
phrase were othered in mainstream, or we could say mailstream society. They emphasized solidarity and collective identity to counter patriarchy. They raised issues of unequal pay, inequality in workplace cultures, uneven access to education, particularly higher education, gendered violence, including sexual violence in the home and in public. They campaign for access to reproductive technologies like contraception and reproductive rights such as abortion. They targeted traditional views of womanhood that assumed women were only destined to mother and to care. And they were galvanized through mass, protest, mass protests and consciousness raising groups, although report, reports of bra burning are largely mythical and exaggerated. In the UK, women's groups noisily disrupted the Miss World contest in 1970, and in 1981, women set up a permanent peace camp at RAF Greenham Common in Berkshire to protest against its housing of nuclear weapons. An incredible example of sustained action. It lasted for 19 years. The camp was only closed in 2000. There are some interesting ways that the relationship between religion and feminism plays out as a result of the energy of second wave feminism in ways that echo and depart from previous forms of the women's movement. Again, there are times when feminism and religion appear quite intimate and mutually dependent. For example, feminist consciousness raising groups were spaces for women to name and overcome their everyday encounters of sexism and patriarchy. For some, this empowering experience in which the personal merges with the political was not necessarily religious, but was considered profound and transformative. If feminism was asking what's wrong, what's unfair, what's oppressive, then of course attention would turn to religion and spirituality. Feminism proved a critical tool and a language to interrogate and transform the patriarchal assumptions of Christian discourse. Initially, feminists challenged male pronouns for people, mankind and man, that they saw written in hymn books and prayer books. And they chastised the systems of clericalism that prohibited women from formal leadership and ordination in most denominations. But this, this soon led to tackling broader issues. <laughs> biblical narratives, theological ethics, church teaching, and eventually the big man himself upstairs, God. In 1971, American feminist Catholic theologian, Mary Daly, there she is, wielding some kind of sword, I think, was invited to be the first woman preacher in Harvard Memorial Church. Her sermon was entitled, The Women's Movement, An Exodus Community. Daly had previously campaigned for women's ordination in her early work, The Church in the Second Sex. But by this point, she had reached the end of her tether with trying to change the Roman Catholic Church's mind. During her sermon, she claimed, we cannot really belong to institutional religion as it exists. The crushing weight of this tradition, of this power structure, tells us we do not even exist. <laughs> finished her preaching by walking out of the church and encouraged other women in the congregation to do the same. Daly, in her later work, Beyond God the Father, clues in the title, she argued that the oppressive structures of Christianity make women less human. And this is encapsulated for her in one single idea, the maleness of God. God, in his heaven, is a father ruling his people, then it is in the nature of things and the order of the universe that society be male dominated. Her, her well-known maxim, if God is male, then the male is God. Some historians of British religion have suggested that the gains made during the second wave, including these critiques of Christianity, but gender norms pertaining to women's work, equitable relationships, a greater understanding and the use of reproductive choice and women's greater political visibility have negatively affected church affiliation and have advanced the process of secularization, the process whereby religion loses influence in the public sphere. Callum Brown, in The Death of Christian Britain, a book was published in 2001, shows how prior to the 1960s, religion was largely identified with femininity 
and women in particular were mainly presented as angels of the house, the keepers, the transmitters of religious and moral virtue on behalf of the family and society. Following the liberalization of sexual and gendered attitudes, behaviors and expectations, women began to draw on other images and motifs of identity that were not reliant on these Christian ideals of womanhood. They found alternatives in the workplace, in education, in politics, in popular culture, and in their leisure activities. And this made them question the very limited options that Christianity had devised for them. Now, it might be difficult to be precise about the extent to which second wave feminism and the gendered cultural revolution have contributed to Christianity's demise, but one of the legacies of the second wave, as Linda Woodhead summarizes, is that as women began to claim ownership of their bodies and sexuality, so they abandoned the subordinate male referential forms of femininity, which had previously defined their lives. Accompanied by the wider cultural turn, which stresses in our very modern world that individuality is having, has a unique value, Second wave feminism prompted women to question authoritative institutions and to seek roles, experiences, identities that spoke to their own sense of self outside of the church. It might not be the case though that feminism is the death knell for religion. While Daly left the church in quite dramatic fashion and definitely inspired others to do so, some women questioned but chose to remain and to try to reform their religious traditions, often in incredibly creative and innovative ways. One woman who participated in my doctoral work, Anne, was raised a Methodist and in her late 70s at the time that I met her. During the interview, she described her feminist awakening as happening with other women who were part of her church community. Laughing in the interview, she recalled how her friends one time snuck into church and decided to hold their own service. They wrote new liturgies. They prayed to Mother God. And in her own words, she says, we sang and we danced in the aisles. Others instead looked for new ways to make meaning that validated and affirmed their experiences. Cynthia Eller, in her 10 year study, traces the emergence of a feminist spiritual consciousness that include images of female power and magic, the writing of rituals, imminent understandings of the goddess as dwelling within women, affirmation of women's experience and sacred meaning making. Women have always found ways to express religious thought and devotion when the usual strictures of religious life, and I usually mean the men here, have prevented them from doing so. But what is particular is that this spirituality developing in the second wave is a self-named feminist movement that's designed to harness and reclaim women's agency. It's written by women, it's written for women, and it draws on women's experiences to think about the sacred and the divine as the starting point for individual and community empowerment. Today, we can think of women's circles, like the Red Tent Movement, as an illustration of a feminist spirituality that began with the second wave. So in similar ways to the first wave, there is a tension between religion and feminism during the 60s, 70s and 80s. On the one hand, in the context of Christianity, women began to reject traditional forms of organized religion that struggled to adapt to the realities of women's lives or seemed unable or unwilling to change an account and to take seriously women's experiences. On the other hand, feminism can empower women to look for and initiate new religious practices and forms of religious expression. Excuse me. Can you hear it anymore? Yeah. During the end of the last century and in time for the new millennium from the 1990s, the third wave of feminism emerged. Finding a single origin is always very difficult. But Rebecca Walker, the daughter of womanist novelist Alice Walker, declared in Ms. Magazine, I am not a post-feminist feminist, I am the third wave. In a deliberate defiance against the conservative backlash claiming the death of feminism. 
The third wave is also a response voiced by women of colour, womanist, muharista, LGBTQIA plus women and Asian women, but the second wave's identification of a singular movement took the experience of women who lived in a predominantly white, educated, European, uh, American, heteronormative, colonial, affluent world as the norm, and that failed to recognise those who lived outside of those parameters of privilege. So the third wave of feminism emerges from these voices dissenting from and responding to feminism's assumed whiteness. The third wave, according to Leslie Hayward, tries to build an inclusive feminism that respects not only difference, but also makes allowances for different identities within a single person. This is an emphasis on individual fluid identity and is influenced by the crucial understanding that oppression is intersectional. The origins of intersectional critique lie in black feminist thought. The term intersectionality is generally credited to the legal theorist Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how categories such as gender, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality and disability interact with and on each other. It's not just an add in and stir, these factors are integrated and inseparable. Third wave theorist Nell P. Sung identifies third wave feminism but it distinguishes itself from its forerunners because it does draw on the multiple ways that the various aspects of individual identity relate. She says, young feminists of the third wave celebrate the pluralities of race, colour, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, class, sexual orientation, nationality and geography, physical disability and age to broaden the boundaries of previous feminisms that are often narrow in scope or altogether skipped over such characteristics. What's missing, of course, as you've all noticed, if you've been paying attention, is that religion is not in that list. It might be that Sung is making it implicit in race, ethnicity or culture, but it's missing as its own category. And this is quite common within much of third wave feminist writing. Religion doesn't seem to feature very much. Third wave feminists don't seem to be very interested in it. There are some exceptions. Dania Ruttenberg's Yentl's Revenge is a collection of first-person narratives from Jewish third-wave feminists. Chris Klassen edited a collection called Feminist Spirituality that thought about what the third wave might mean for Christian and post-Christian religious and spiritual practices, discourses and theories. When religion is mentioned, it's often only really fleetingly. Again, if we think about Rebecca Walker's work, she has an anthology called To Be Real. And there's one mention of a young woman identifying as Christian and feminist who feels excluded from the narrative of feminism. Hayward and Drake take on examples of religion as a, a way in which the third way uh, can work at the edges of contradiction. And Baumgartner and Richards's manifesto, they claim the way they which, in which they ditched Wicca to concentrate more on intellectual and personal ideas. But an explicit address of either connection or disconnection between religion and the third wave rarely features. It might be that third wave feminists are just not that really into religion. In a survey of over 50 feminist groups, all formed in the 21st century in the UK, Kristen Owner and Catherine Redfern, among other things, ask these women about spirituality. Atheism was the most popular self-designation, approximately 39% of the sample identified as atheist. When religion was referred to, it was named as an intersectional structure of oppression and inequality, just like race or class. Could I just ask everyone to make sure they're muted? I'm so sorry, <laughs> thanks. When religion was referred to, it was named as, uh, as a structure of oppression and inequality like race or class. More often than not, it was considered a negative force in women's lives. Owner and Redfern note that when their participants do mention religion, it's seen as a problem. Fundamentalism uh, is seen as a, having a negative impact on women's rights. Christianity and Islamic regimes are mentioned as being impediments to women's liberation. And some participants refer to the need for equality in religious uh, leadership. 
As Ona and Redfern note, and they conclude, for these feminists, religion and spirituality were considered far less important than other issues. Where religion was mentioned, it was seen so as something that justified injustice towards women. If religion is considered this way by Ona and Redfern's participants, it receives similar treatment in third wave writings. It's often treated as a paradoxical and specialist area of interest, rather than ever examined in terms of women's own lived religious practices, their theological worldviews, or the ways in which it shapes uh, their meanings and values. Religious identities and experiences are often conceived to be in contest with feminism. Sonia D. Curry Johnson considers, she says, her acute case of multiplicity, it sounds like a disease, as she identifies as an educated, married, monogamous, feminist, Christian, African-American mother. And the pace alludes to the hostile tension between her religion and her feminism. Robin Nidal speaks of the contradictions she faces, she says, by living out of a paradox of being Jewish and feminism. Mandava reflects on a reconciliation between her Hindu heritage. And Daraj says she has, to have, she has had to grapple with the eyebrow raising self identification as an Arab American feminist. So in the third wave, what you get in these examples is religious identity is enjoined with a feminist outlook, but it's just not an easy partnership. Third wave religious identities are presented as part of women's broader cultural identity that acknowledges the influence of religion, but doesn't examine religious practices or texts or the lived aspect of identity. Third wave religious identities are seen as a contradiction in which feminists have to overcome many difficulties to engineer ways to hold their religious and political affiliations together. I'm not saying that many women don't experience this. It's often a reality, often too painful for many women, but it does very quickly depict religious feminism as a paradox and imagines contradiction as the only way religion, religion and feminism might coexist. Religious feminists have long noted that so-called secular feminist theory often forgets religion. There is sometimes an assumption that feminists working in religion can be seen by secular feminists as religious and therefore politically neutral and traditionalists. This happens to me really frequently. Two things happen. People either often assume I am religious because I teach about religion and that I'm Christian because I teach about Christianity or I'm kind of uh, questioned for the fact that how can I teach Christianity if I'm not Christian? Judith Plasco argues that the slippage is perhaps due to the close connections that the academic discipline of women and religion has with women's faith communities. Penelope McGee describes this sacred secular binary at, that separates religion from academic feminism. Although Anglo-American feminism originated in a Christian context, this sacred secular divide is a historical overhang from feminism's origins in the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment suspicion of the enchanted world, enchanted world and its privileging of personal autonomy over external authoritative structures. And of course, feminism does have socialist Marxist roots too. So for many feminists then, religion is seen as antithetical to modernity, to progress, to autonomy, which means that religious women can be assumed to be traditional, conservative, that they require liberation, that they're suffering from a false consciousness, consciousness that tethers them to an oppressive regime, despite living in the contemporary world. Well, why might this matter? In an article I co-wrote with my dear friend and colleague, Marta Ciespiotowska, who's a sociologist at the University of Aberdeen, we discussed this tendency to think about religion and feminism as antagonistically entwined, and we suggest it's really problematic. Religion is a crucial aspect of women's lives, globally. And therefore not paying attention to how women negotiate religious practices or teachings is very neglectful. We can think of the way that Muslim women who choose to veil, despite numerous debates on the subjects, are often treated as victims by those who speak out against veiling. Or those who have abandoned the practice themselves are often applauded by secular feminists as being enlightened 
and on the right side of the fence. Another example is the debate on female circumcision, sometimes called female genital mutilation or cutting. I'm not condoning the practice, but in such cases, religion tends to be singled out as the oppressive mechanism that drives it. And little attention is paid to the myriad social, cultural and historical factors that operate to maintain the custom. It would, of course, be totally inaccurate to say that religion is absent from the ways in which this practice is justified. But as Mary Wangila, amongst others, argues at length, it cannot be isolated as the universally valid reason for female circumcision to continue. Of course, there are cultural and historical factors, and they must be examined in each case in order to determine what, if any, the role that religion justifications can play. And religion can be used to also oppose it. So the solution is not to just assume, as a white middle class feminist living in Chester, that women who are part of such religious communities who are pressured to undergo this procedure need to be secularized. But maybe it's our job to empower, stand with and stand by women who want to end the practice for themselves and for their sisters. In Wangila's own words, religion is one of the most powerful institutions for perpetuating sexism and patriarchal authority. It also has the potential to address the very problem of oppression. Religion can be a very powerful instrument to deconstruct oppressive social stereotypes and to work to transform attitudes and social behavior. In the recent case of the Russian band uh, Pussy Riot, religion can be mobilized as a tool for any social, cultural or political machination, be it feminist or not. Religion itself in this case is not a force that can liberate or dominate a whim, but like any other social phenomena, dependent on the relations of power in a particular time and place. On the 17th of August, 2012, Pussy Riot, three members of Pussy Riot were sentenced to death for hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. The women have been part of uh, the Pussy Riot um, performance um, art group, and they had entered Christ the Saviour Cathedral in Moscow in February 2012 to perform their anti-Putin song, A Punk Prayer. You can find it on YouTube, it's really worth a watch. So here we have a riot girl inspired feminist art group speaking out about the corrupt political system in Russia by staging a protest in a building which symbolizes the support that the religious institution has for the state. Secular feminism is pitched here directly against organized feminism, organized religion, sorry. And the latter wins by charging the former with disrespect, obscenity and blasphemy, all of which could be understood as a challenge to the established patriarchal order. In this reading, secular feminism and religion are incompatible at best and natural enemies at worst. What makes this case complex is that the members of Pussy Riot chose the cathedral because it's an emblem of what they were protesting against, rather than because they object to religion per se. Religion is neither the oppressor nor the liberator, but it is a clear instance of us as a, as a work, religion as working as a symbol of traditional and social order and that being hijacked for political causes. In the case of religious women, piety and practices have too often been forgotten about or hijacked. According to Sam, we are now in the fourth wave of feminism. In 2003, Anne Kaplan called for a fourth wave that focused on generational overlap, the persistence to keep tackling those gendered inequalities that have been a recurrent theme across the ways of feminism. A closer relationship she called for between theory and activism and a feminism that considers globalization and new technologies. In the UK in 2013, journalist Kira Cochran observed, everywhere you looked in the summer of 2013, a fourth wave of feminism was rising. We can think of Nimco Ali, Laura Bates, Catelyn Moran, Caroline Criado Perez, Sarah Ahmed, the Pussy Hat Marches, the Me Too movements, and certainly the way in which my students are literate and politically aware of LGBTQI plus issues, how they understand intersectionality, how they know how to check their privilege, and how they use and harness social media and on -time online technologies to, to tackle gender injustice and to build feminism. 
So what is the relationship between feminism and religion in this current stage? It's a little too early to say, but again, theoretically, religion isn't featuring very heavily in the uh, academic reflections on the fourth wave so far. But I know what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more connection between feminism and religion. Religion, as I've suggested, is too often neglected as a category of identity. And yet it's a category that intersects with other identities and other categories. And it can also be subdivided. Religious and the spiritual is complex and it's multiform. It can be broken down according to tradition, to denomination, to practice, and any other number of variances. variances. It can add layers of complexity to how women define themselves. When we overlook religion, feminism brackets out the complicated work that religions do in, their many, in its many complicated ways in many people's lives. I'd like to see less assuming that religious women lack agency. I'd like to see less of the fact that feminism is seen as incompatible with religion. There are lots of religious feminists out there. And I'd like to see less of the ways in which women identifying as religious are oblivious, uh, are understood as being oblivious to the patriarchal structures of their faith communities. But I do want to reserve a little bit of tension because a little bit of dissonance can be creative. Feminist engagements with religion can highlight inequalities in teachings, traditions, and exploring the faith and spiritual realms can reveal new instances of self-defining women's autonomy, authority, and empowerment. So I don't really want to solve the ways that feminism and religion can rub up against each other. In some ways, I'm quite happy for religion and feminism to be complicated. I'm sort of okay with tricky.